liked all the talks during the week. It was very interesting and very stimulating. So I want to speak uh, about a topic which is on one side very much related to other talks because it's also related to real resonances and hyperbolic dynamical systems. On the other side, it's a little bit off topic because it does not treat flow as uh, so. And so far we have only seen, uh, mostly seen talks about flows. This is about Amazon action, so I would like to start with uh, introducing these Anosov actions and connecting them to uh, uh, Anosov flows, which uh, probably all people in the audience uh, know, or most of, nearly all people in the audience know very, very well. So, um, what is um, Anosov action? So, we all have seen many times what a flow is. So, for me, um, M will always be a closed. Manifold. And uh, an Anosov flow can then be seen as the group R acting on N on M locally free. And uh, if I have such an action of R, which is my time, um, then uh, the tangent space at a point. So, yeah, on the one side I have the orbit through the point. Yeah, the orbit of the flow through this point. And um, uh, if I take the tangent space tangent to the orbit, then this is, uh, uh, becomes the neutral direction of the flow. And then transversely, I have an unstable and stable direction. And I have the famous condition that um, if I take d phi t restricted <coughs> to the stable direction and its operator norm, or d minus t restricted to the unstable direction, then this is smaller equal to c constant minus beta t for t larger than zero. So now, uh, what do we have to change to, to get an analysis of action? So the idea is that I want to study a similar thing, but not with a time that is one dimensional, but uh, I want an uh, action of a higher rank, a higher dimensional space RK acting on this manifold. So now what I, do I have to modify here? I mean, here I still have orbits. Yeah? And now the orbits are not just one-dimensional immersed submanifold, so, but it's R-dimensional submanifold. So this becomes, in any case, an R-dimensional space. So I can't do anything about this. Yeah? R action, so there can't be instability along the orbit. That's clear. But I can suppose that transversely to the orbits, there is an unstable and stable direction. But now I have to pay a little bit attention because here uh, I have this guy here, t larger than zero. And on R, it's very natural. Yeah, I mean, you have a positive side and a negative side. On a higher dimensional space, what is positive, what is negative? Yeah, this is kind of maybe the most uh, uh, different thing here. And uh, the assumption is uh, more or less the, the most the minimal thing that you can do here, yeah? Um, you have a higher dimensional uh, space, RK. Okay, K is 2 here in this picture. So the least that I can uh, assume is that there is one direction in which I, I can pick one direction in this higher dimensional space such that I have this behavior. So in other words, there is a, uh, a zero in R. So it exists. A zero in Rk such that this holds if I take the action uh, in the direction of F -S A zero. So we have a, uh, with a positive, we fix the direction in this space, we have a positive direction in this one where stable is stable and unstable is unstable, and we have a negative direction where things turn around. So the interesting thing, or well, it's a very basic lemma. Yeah? Um, if you have only one such a direction, 
Then I have a whole open cone of uh, direction which uh, preserve this, uh, uh, which, which have the same unstable and stable post-splitting. So lemma exists uh, open, even convex uh, cone W in RK such that um, yeah, call this here H for hyperbolicity, yeah, such that H holds for all um, A in and it's and the E S and the E U are the same spaces for the exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. There exists. The only thing is that of course this will depend on uh, on the choice of your vector field, but the stable and the unstable direction stay the same. Yeah, and uh, the proof is very simple. Uh, yeah, if I write proof in this talk, I will never give the full proof, but the uh, basic idea. So what do I have to do? I have such a direction in which we ha I have this stable and unstable thing, and now I have to perturb it. I mean, I want to show openness. Yeah, uh, just the openness. So I take. Uh, another vector b uh, in rk and what do I have to do? Uh, I have to take for example an element in the stable bundle so this is really the stable bundle of, uh, of my uh, vector field a0 and then I have to study what happens if I take the differential of t times a plus epsilon b so I take a direction and I want to have a small perturbation of the direction, a, but this is a0. Uh, and now the crucial thing is that this is a commutative, yeah, and a commutative action. Because uh, what I can do then is I write this as e t, t epsilon b uh, d phi t a0 of v. And now I can uh, uh, take the operator norm of this guy and the norm of this guy. Now here I know v was in the end stable, in the stable direction. Yeah. So I, I uh, consider t large. Yeah. So this is uh, by hyperbolicity in the a zero direction. Yeah. This is smaller equal c to the e minus b beta t. And what is this? Well, I can't control this action at all, but my manifold is compact. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this is a, a semi-group, yeah? So it grows, it might grow exponentially, yeah? But it can only grow exponentially. So I can have, I can bound this guy by C tilde E to the C B epsilon T, yeah? So this might grow exponentially, but not worse than exponentially. And the good thing is now, um, well, this was positive. So it just need to make epsilon small enough that just that this guy is, uh, that the beta wins against this exponential growth. Yeah? Uh, and uh, which shows you at least the openness. Yeah? And convexity is similar, but a little bit more technical. I, I don't want to mention this. So uh, the picture is that, in fact, you do not only have a direction, but you have really uh, a cone of positive directions with respect to fixed stable and unstable splitting. And of course, uh, simply by time reversing in this higher dimensional space, uh, you have a, another cone, yeah, um, a negative cone, which is also a positive cone if you switch stable and unstable bundles. Yeah? And now, what is here in this space? And that's a little bit obscure. Usually what happens in, in, in most known examples is that if you if you approach uh, one of these boundaries of this wild chamber, then these e, in these EU spaces, there is one direction, so one Yapunov exponent, which goes to zero. And if you go to the other side, switch a sign. Yeah? And which means that if, if you go here, there's also another wild chamber. But uh, part of this space is part of the unstable direction became stable, and part of the stable direction become unstable. Yeah? And you, usually what you have is uh, several codes. And every time that you uh, transverse such a 
chamber, uh, that such a boundary of this uh, chamber, yeah, it uh, wants one dimension of EU swaps to AES and, and vice versa. And uh, if you have done the tour, then all spaces have swapped. Yeah? This is kind of a thing which, is, uh, which only can happen in higher rank, yeah? in, in rank one, in the mm -hmm. flows. Yeah? Uh, the only way to pass from the positive to the negative chamber is try, just turning around and, and everything swaps. But this picture is not always true. There are weird kind of Anosov actions where, um, where uh, you don't have an open set of Anosov elements. Yeah? So there might be gaps where uh, you don't find, um, uh, you, you don't find uh, uh, where, yeah. So, so it might be that you have a cone here and another cone here, but here uh, you don't have any hyperbolicity or so. Yeah? Um, these are very strange examples, uh, but they exist. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, examples. I would just maybe mention some examples. The prototypical example um, is, uh, is uh, similar to the hyperbolic surface. You take, um, you take a two compact lattice in SL K plus 1 R. So in K is 1. If you are in the rank 1 case, this is simply SL2. Yeah? And uh, then you consider uh, gamma, uh, so this is what we should be called compact. Uh, so you have uh, K plus 1 R, and then you act uh, here from the right with the group A, which consists of diagonal matrix, and because you are in SL, because the determinant is 1 then this space is isomorphic to Rk, yeah? because you have k plus 1 entries on the diagonal, but 1 is fixed to the determinant, so this is an Rk action. And this is, in fact, uh, maybe the most prototypical example of an Anosov action. Then there are, exist such examples for arbitrary uh, uh, semi-simple groups of, uh, of higher rank, yeah? not only SL2, there are lots of other groups. And, yeah, and then it becomes... Uh, Interesting uh, concerns examples. So, ah, Tibodo password. Okay, so I've depicted here, I mean, this is kind of a summary of the conference, yeah? This is the world of Anasov flows. I think uh, the first talk, uh, Mark Polygot was talking about uh, uh, hyperbolic surfaces, uh, uh, H modulo gamma. And then I think we see all these kind of different instances of, uh, of uh, Anosov flows. Yeah, we've seen a lot on in strict negative curvature. Then Collin was uh, explaining how to, res uh, to, to generalize this rigidity from strict negative curvature to anatomy of geodesic flows. Then there were talks about contact Anosov flows, volume preserving Anosov flows, general Anosov flows. And in particular, in the talk of, uh, of Gabriel, uh, we've seen that we can really also, between these kind of different families, I don't know if it's my. Yeah. So we can also deform continuously between these kind of families by uh, different manipulations, perturbations of this vector field. Yeah? So the world of other such actions is much more fragmented. Yeah? So I, I told you that we have these uh, prototypical examples which are called wild chamber flows because uh, in this case this positive chamber is really a, an algebraic wild chamber coming from the structure theory of the Lie groups. Then we can, of course, uh, take suspensions of automorphisms on Lie manifolds. So you have com if you have uh, Lie manifolds with commuting uh, Anosov diffeomorphisms, you can take suspensions of them, which give also Anosov actions. Then there are other kind of algebraic examples. And these are called uh, standard actions or algebraic actions. Then, of course, what you always have in higher rank is you take arbitrary two Anosov flows and take the product of them. Yeah? Uh, then you have not only well, you have one time acting on one space, another time acting on the other space. Obviously, this commutes, and obviously this has all these nice properties. So, in some sense, all the world of Anosov flows is here inside here. But of course, uh, you do not gain new insight by studying products or so. Yeah, everything splits into products, and then uh, yeah, and then uh, there are not much more examples. So. And the reason is it's, it's uh, rigidity in higher rank. I think these rigidity results go back uh, to the 80s. Uh, I think there were 
pioneering works of uh, Keith Burns and Stassi and uh, Stassi and Katok, uh, who were treating rigidity in, 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 in higher rank. So, for example, it's known that these Anosov uh, actions, they cannot be perturbed to something different yeah, locally. And then there is an old conjecture of Katok and Spazier that if you don't have rank one factors, yeah, then basically that's it. Yeah? But this turned out to be, uh, uh, very recently apparently it turned out to be not true, at least not true as, uh, as, uh, as, um, as uh, usually formulated. There is a very recent uh, uh, preprint by Kurt Winheg where he takes a product of uh, two Anosov flows and makes a clever time change such that uh, he can prove that uh, the resulting Anosov action is neither, has neither a rank one factor nor is it a, an algebraic action. Yeah? And so it's uh, more, much less understood. Yeah? And uh, so and of course there are many, many works that are this field because here um, you have lots of very strong tools to work with. Yeah? I mean, this is all algebraic uh, formulated on Lie groups. You can use uh, harmonic analysis. You can use the structure theory of these Lie groups. You have very strong methods to, to work on these things. Yeah? And our approach was, uh, OK, we, we just want to use only the hyperbolicity um, uh, to treat uh, really the whole world of, uh, of Anosov actions. Yeah? Um, exactly. Good. Um, continue. What is a suspension of? How do you suspend an action on a image format? Uh, how? how do you define the suspension of an action? Uh, in, uh, you, you just don't take a sphere, but a torus, yeah, for your suspension. Then you have different times and uh, for. Oh. When it's suspension, every time that you cross the line, I mean, suspension is R modulo Z, yeah? Every time that you take Z, you take one generator. If you have R2 modulo Z2, if you have two computing hyperbolic generators, then you do the oh, same. Okay. Yeah, so the next thing that I want to display is what. Um, of course, periodic orbits are very important in, um, uh, for Anosov of flows, we know this. And what, how do periodic orbits look like um, the, for this Anosov of action? So, um, So assume that you have a point and a multidimensional time uh, such that if you act with this time on x, nothing happens. So it may be okay. <coughs> Not zero, yeah? Then, of course, uh, as this is an, 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 an r action, every integer multiple of time also fixes this, this point. Yeah, that's, that's obvious. Um, but uh, even more is true. If this A0 is in the open while chamber, so if, if I have a periodic point into a regular direction, uh, then I can define, well, this I can define every time. So I can define L as all A in RK that stabilize this point. Yeah? This is always defined. It's always, I mean, it's always a discrete subgroup of RK. Yeah? Uh, because the action is free, and because it's an action, this is a stabilizer group. Yeah? And, but the, the statement of the lemma is if there is one periodic point into a regular direction. This is a lattice of full rank. Uh, which means that the orbit of x is rk modulo a, which is a compact torus. Okay. So as soon as, as, soon as you have a you 
while, ch while chamber one point, which is periodic, then you do, do not only have a repetition of these points, but you have a kind of uh, full uh, co-compact lattice in, in RK of periodic points. Yeah? Um, along the walls, if, if, if the periodic point is along the walls, this is not true. And this can be most easily seen if you take the product direction. If you have two other flows, if you pick a periodic point on the one surface and a point with a dense orbit on the other surface, then into one direction you have periodicity. Yeah? You have recurrent T such that it stabilizes. Uh, and uh, in the other direction, as, uh, you have a dense orbit. So the orbit has the structure of a torus, which is dem densely embedded into your manifold. <coughs> But in the regular direction, something like this cannot appear. So uh, generically, yeah, I mean these orbits are um, compact tori. Yeah. And of course, if I have such a compact tori, periods is, is lattice points. Yeah. The periodic uh, period times uh, are described by lattices in RK. Good. So then I can state our our result. I should state the result. Um, here, uh, this is a new and Guillaume. Uh, so, for simplicity, I will assume that phi is transitive. There is at least one orbit, a really multidimensional orbit, this is dense. Yeah? Not one dimensional orbit, multidimensional orbit, this is dense. Um, we also have results in the non transitive case, but it becomes much more complicated to formulate. I want to, if you can look this up in the paper. Um, so, what is the statement? Okay, we have these periodic orbits, yeah? and uh, I can sum about. Uh, all these compact periodic orbits. And for each such a periodic orbit, I have uh, this lattice. Yeah? Now, I don't want, maybe I have to draw another picture here. Um, I don't want to sum over all orbits points, but only into somehow orbit points into a positive direction. Yeah? Um, so, uh, what I do is, um, I take a proper subcomb of W. So, let me draw a picture. No, I need the space. I need to draw a picture maybe here. Chamber. And then I take a proper subcone, open subcone, proper meaning that it does not touch uh, the walls. Yeah? And um, I take uh, a dual element here and define CR to be those elements in the cone. A is smaller R, which means that I, uh, I I take a hyperplane that cuts the cone, yeah, and I cut the cone here at uh, somehow I R. So this is C R, yeah. So I take a, a, a cone and I cut it at a, at a certain time, and my aim is to take this time towards infinity. Yeah. Yeah. Asia is, so the kernel of Asia is somehow sort of transverse to the kernel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to take, a, yeah, I should, uh, you have to form, uh, eta has to be. It's clear, in the, it's clear in the picture. Yeah, it's explained in the picture, yeah. It always has to be like this, of course, not, uh, uh, not a stupid eta, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so now I have for each torus I have these lattice points, and this lattice point lies somewhere. And so there's one torus here and another the lattice might be somewhere here. And I want to take all these lattice points that are in this uh, orange cone. Yeah? So I, I take this lattice point and I intersect them with my cones. And now I can take a Dirac distribution on the torus, yeah? which appears to, uh, uh, or the Dirac measure yeah? on this torus. And I also put a weight. And the weight is d phi a restricted to this space. This might, weight might seem a little bit uh, maybe unnatural, but in some sense not, because uh, of, uh, of polycord it was said that this is a natural way to put into a theta function and so on. Yeah? So it appears naturally usually if you take the spectral theoretic approach. So we take this weight. Uh, so for fixed R, this is a finite sum of, sum of direct measures, yeah. and I want to normalize this. So if I increase R, if I increase the size, then more and more direct measures uh, will occur. This will blow up. But if I renormalize with the volume um, of my cone, then the theorem is that I can take the limit of these measures towards infinity. And uh, it exists, this uh, and is independent of the choice of my subcode. Yeah. And of eta. Sorry. Also independent of eta. To, to what? You chose eta as well as the cone. Ah, yeah, of theta and eta. No. Yeah. Yeah. And so delta t is the sort of. Um, I don't know, Lebesgue measure on the torus. Yes, yes. so the, the, the measure here on it is um, you have the Lebesgue measure on your space RK, you fix it, and uh, you push it forward to the, to the torus. Yeah, precisely. So does the measure depend on W, as you say? It does not depend on C, but on W? Yes, it depends on W. In general, it will depend. Yeah. Uh, this is what, what you see in the, next, in, the, in the second part of the theorem. So the first theorem is that this converges. And the other part is um, mu is phi invariant and fulfills. Well, first thing is that the wave front set of mu is in the two stable direction. Second thing is it's absolutely continuous with respect to the local stable foliation. So ah, this is maybe, this is not the wild chamber, this is now the, 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 fully, the local foliation into stable uh, manifolds, yeah? Um, what else holds? holds? Um, uh, for Nebeck, almost every, point x on my manifold. Yeah? So I have a compact manifold. I can choose any Lebesgue measure. Yeah? This is not invariant in general. Yeah? Um, but for Lebesgue, almost every point x on my manifold, um, mu of f is given by a Birkhoff average um, of um, f times uh, P A X uh, probably a minus here. Uh, P A if I uh, and uh, uh, here is missing a limit. Yeah. So this in 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 time one. Yeah. This is simply a Birkhoff average in, in forward time. Yeah. And uh, and uh, I don't know anything else. I think that's it. No. Yeah. No. And these are kind of uh, in particular. F is a real valued function on E. F, F is a even compact, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Continuous, uh, continuous function. Uh, yeah. Continuous positive function, let's say. Yeah. 
Yeah. And in particular, those two points are classical characterization of SRB measures in, uh, for flows. Yeah? So SRB measures are the unique invariant measures such that they are absolutely continuous with respect to the uh, stable ring. And, and this is kind of sometimes termed uh, physical measure such that you have a, that it has an, an open attract, uh, an, uh, attractor of Le positive Lebesgue measure. Yeah? And here you have a full Lebesgue measure because we have transitivity and we have uh, and uh, <clears throat> I've not written this here, vice versa, if you have an invariant measure that satisfies any of these assumptions, so suffices only one, then it's uniquely characterized and uh, it's this measure we, yeah? Uh, we have transitivity, yeah, so there we have unique, uh, unique SRB measures here. If you don't have, and this is where, if, if you don't have uh, transitivity, then uh, the reverse thing does not work, yeah? Then you might have different, uh, different SRB measures, yeah? Um, okay. Uh, we have a wild chamber flow of these algebraic actions, then uh, mu is simply uh, is simply the Haar measure. Uh, then there is an invariant smooth measure on all these algebraic actions because you have the Haar measure on the group G and it gives you an invariant measure. Uh, so in particular, the, the, the last three points are not that in interesting because it's clear that the Haar measure is, uh, is the Lebesgue measure, and then it's a, as it's an ergodic measure, this is uh, just Birkhoff, uh, Birkhoff uh, ergodic theorem, yeah, the, the last point. And uh, absolutely continuity is, is also known since long time that hyperbolic foliations are absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure always. Uh, so then, these are not new, but the, the other point is still interesting because what does it tell you? It does tell you that um, if I take these periodic torus orbits, yeah, in, if I average over these orbits, that they equidistribute. In some sense, uh, then we get an equidistribution of torus of it with respect to um, and uh, in, in this setting, yeah, there are also related results. So there's uh, two articles of uh, Einsiedler, Linden, Strauss, Venkatesh, and Michel, uh, 2009 and 2011, where they studied equidistribution of torus uh, orbits with respect to Haar measure on uh, to my understanding, not all anodes of actions, but a certain classes of anodes of actions which are particularly arithmetic. So one paper is just devoted to SL3 modulo SL3 set, and it uses very heavy um, subconvexity things about uh, L functions and so on. And there they also derive equidistribution of these torus orbits for SL3. I think even stronger ones than stronger equidistribution estimates than we obtain. And then in as an other paper in the co-contact case, and it's not, I think it's a kind of different type of equidistribution, yeah? I mean, they, they have a very number theoretic point of view of uh, phrasing their things. And uh, uh, for me, it's even difficult to understand about what kind of orbits they average. Yeah? They also average over certain sets of orbits, but it's termed, for them, an orbit is a point in an algebraic variety, and then um, they have some notion there. And, uh, but uh, it's surely related, yeah? And then, Recently, a little bit uh, uh, after our work, there's the was a paper of Jiagun uh, and uh, uh, Tidong, um, who was also studying equidistribution of the Haar measure for this uh, wild chamber flows, and they obtain uh, even stronger results than what we obtained with our general spectral methods. Yeah, uh, they really used uh, uh, 
harmonic analysis and structure theory on these spaces, and they obtain stronger results than, than we do. Yeah, this, uh, um, yeah, uh, as to mention. Another thing, interesting thing, is that more or less at the same time as, as we published this thing as a preprint, there was a preprint of uh, Carrasco and Federico uh, Hertz, uh, who prove uh, this property, uh, uh, who prove existence and uniqueness of measures with this uh, absolute continuity property, even in, in a more general setting. So the, they prove it in a, a for, for center isometries, so hyperbolic center isometries, yeah? Uh, but uh, one case is that you take uh, one action into a certain direction of, an, uh, of, of such an Anosov action, and if you apply their results here, you also get a unique measure, absolute continuous measure with, with this property. And they use uh, uh, different methods. So they don't use spectrotheoretic things, but more traditional thermodynamic formalism things to obtain, uh, to obtain this, uh, this part of the result. So do you have an example of where mu is not a horror measure and mu is not a product measure? Uh, yes, well, that's uh, this example of, um, of uh, this recent uh, uh, example by Kurt. But there is also a little bit cheated because this, it starts with a product. There um, you could take two, he has no assumptions on the Anosov flows. There's two Anosov flows in dimension three. You could take two of them that are not volume preserving. You take the product measure and then you deform, but as it is a time change, uh, it's more or less trivial how to change the SIB measure. Mm -hmm. So honestly, um, yeah, uh, so these things might be uh, talking about the uh, empty set, but, uh, it, it, <laughs> no, but it might even it might nevertheless be worth talking about the empty set because there is, uh, for example, a paper by Spatier and, I don't know, uh, um, there is a GAFA paper Years ago, where they prove rigidity, so they prove somehow that for the summer sanctions, uh, if, if the action is Cartan, and if and then they assume that there is an invariant measure, invariant ergodic measure of full support, and they assume this ad hoc, and they have no evidence that this should, I mean, uh, that there is uh, a way to construct this, and we provide a way to construct this, and and many of these kind of attempts to prove. Rigidity. So I mean, I think the, the very difficult thing to prove this global rigidity question is that you, in this unknown world, you don't have any. I mean, <laughs> there is nothing. Yeah. I mean, you want to prove that the the, the, the aim is to prove that the set is empty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what 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 maybe this could be helpful is that you you know if there would be something, then there would be a measure, and then you can do things with the measure. And this is what um, uh, Katok and do you recall the the second offer? I sorry, I forgot. Um, Spatier, it's not Vignette? Spatier and... Uh, Vignette, maybe? No, no, I think this was not Vignette. Uh, okay. It was before. Okay, Spatier and... Uh, Spatier and someone, yeah? Uh, they you, can mention, you can mention the fact that the ex example of Vignette, uh, it's not totally an Yes. This is not totally an yeah. So the conjecture still stands for totally an Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is totally Anasov? Totally Anasov means that there are no gaps between the right channels. Okay. But then the, the Anasov elements are gaps. Yeah? And, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's true, uh, Thibault, we don't know examples where this gives new interesting measures, but it might nevertheless be worth having this uh, in order to prove that this set is really empty, because uh, if you have invariant measure with nice properties, you can. It's more hands on, yeah, to do things. Yeah. The one point one of the theorem is a new the new way of thinking about yes. these kind of measures. Yeah. It's maybe our, uh, the microlocal way of characterizing these measures, yeah. And this is the same thing that we've seen in the flow case. Yeah, which uh, Gabriel mentioned in his talk and just, yeah. So just just that seems an important development. Yeah, I mean but this is somehow more or less, I would say, known in Batali Liverani. I mean, Batali Liverani don't use the notion of wavefront set, but if you compare Batali Liverani and uh, Force Justran, uh, then it's more or less, uh, maybe it's nowhere written, yeah, but it's uh, uh, Force Justran proof uh, characterizing with wavefront set, and Batali Liverani showed that the spectral projector at, the, at, at zero is the SIB measure. And as the resolvent, uh, it, the resolvent doesn't care whether you are 
uh, you are you are meromorphically continued in a micro-local space or in a space in a geometric anisotropic space. The resolvent doesn't care; it's unique. The residues are unique. So, in some sense, this first point for rank one is um, is. Uh, Okay. Ah. I'd like to say a few things about uh, about the proof. Classical for flow, uh, the, the one on the right. Yes, or, uh, it's a kind of Bowen's Bowen formula. Mm -hmm. yeah. This was kind of our motivation that in the for the SRB measure, this is uh, this is uh, I think Bowen original Bowen formula is for the measure of maximal entropy without the determinant uh, below. Uh -huh. But I think uh, I for SRB measure, this is also very very okay. long. Long time. Okay. Now, um, could you consider also a construction of uh, other types of measures with different weights? You know, like uh, we've not done this, um, but uh, uh, it's a natural thing to ask whether this kind of spectral theory you can do it, for example, in the in 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 in, in the in the bundles of forms. Yeah. Well, we we done the spectral theory in arbitrary bundles. But we've not characterized that uh, leading resonances are actually measures. That's, uh, that's missing. But you cannot, you cannot put potentials, no? Okay, with potential. Well, the problem is, is very rigid. Yeah? There are not too many potentials such that it stays commutative. Yeah? That's kind of the. Okay. Also, the potential thing is, uh, is very rigid yeah? if you want to preserve commuti commutativity. Yeah? So there's no equilibrium states. Well, there's one statement that in the algebraic case, if you have a invariant measure with positive entropy, I think uh, it has to be the hard measure or something like this. So, <laughs> not in the non-algebraic case. Yeah, yeah, not in the non-algebraic case. In the non-algebraic case, you have to, for the product case, we don't know anything. Even, even maximal entropy. Maximal entropy makes it true. I didn't pay attention when I started. When should I stop? Yeah, you should stop at so 55, 55, but I mean, you were at 0. Okay, so yeah, I have to wrap up things a little bit. So, um, what are these real Taylor resonances? So, um, in, in fact, this theorem about the measure is based on another theorem. Um, about, uh, which is a purely spectral theoretic result, um, which can be stated as follows. So if I take uh, any direction, I can associate a vector field by just differentiating along the action. And this gives me vector fields uh, which commute with each other. And now I can consider a joint spectrum, and uh, I can uh, I can ad hoc define it as follows. So I take those lambda in C k. Now a spectrum, as we are in higher rank, and as we have commuting operators, a spectrum is not, a spectral value is not only one complex number, but it's a k tuple of complex numbers, um, such that it exists a distribution with wavefront set in the unstable direction, uh, non-zero, such that xa minus or plus uh, lambda a u is zero. Yeah. So this is kind of an ad hoc definition. And very briefly, the theorem uh, of, uh, this is a previous paper also with uh, uh, with Yannick, uh, uh, Collin, and also Hilgert, 
uh, in a nutshell, the, 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 the theorem says that this is a discrete set. Yeah? Sigma uh, Taylor uh, in CK is discrete. And uh, can do. A is still the original uh, ah, element line, sorry. right? Sorry. For all A in RK. So that's only. Okay. It's not only the one direction, it's uh, in all directions. Yeah? In the back chamber or in the. No, no, well, it doesn't. Uh, this doesn't. It's a linear thing, yeah? I mean, you could you'd just choose a basis. Mm. Yeah? So inside the cone, it gives you the discrete, but outside, it gives you nothing. No, no, it's uh, discrete everywhere. So A really in, in all directions. Uh, I mean, in, also in the flow case, if you have an, because you have this here, yeah? If you change the sign for, of A, this changes the, the sign of lambda. And if you have a real resonance, yeah? Uh, if you go in negative time, it's still an eigenfunction, but with an opposite eigenvalue, yeah? Okay, and this is kind of incorporated in this, in this thing, yeah? So it's into all direction, it's an, arbitrary direction, it's a joint eigenfunction of this RK action. Yeah? Uh, yeah, maybe let me show you how roughly this looks, because I mean, you're right, there is something, there is something with the cone. Um, here's an, an attempt to draw these um, resonances. Yeah, the problem is somehow in higher rank, uh, A is already two-dimensional, so C2 is four-dimensional, so we have to always cut down one dimension. So let me explain. So this plane here, it depicts an R2. So this is, uh, uh, this is my R2, yeah? which uh, here it's denoted by V algebra A. And in these uh, in, in, in uh, times of direction, I have the positive wild shimmer here, this blue region. Yeah? And then transversely here, I have another two dim real two-dimensional space, which is the imaginary part. But I can only draw one line. Yeah? But uh, this line is two-dimensional here. And then what we can prove is that the resonances, that the wild chamber is important, but the wild chamber tells you where the resonances is. And if you, if you recall in the flow case, the flow case says that uh, all resonances have a uh, real part lower or equal to zero. Yeah? If, uh, uh, here, what does it mean, lower or equal to zero? This positive cone has, an, has a dual cone here. Yeah? And here, the resonances have to lie in this green region. Yeah? So they have, uh, in some sense, they have a negative real part with respect to this chosen uh, positive code. Yeah? But if you have this, you, you all also see um, what, uh, uh, what the leading resonance is. So here's, here's a wedge here. And here, this zero, this is associated to, uh, this spectral point is associated to these SRB measures. Yeah? And also, uh, one thing is, uh, here on this axis, you can have resonances. And for example, if you take suspensions, you will have them. And you can also show with this notion of spectrum that uh, the Anosov action is, um, is mixing, not exponentially mixing, but mixing, if and only if zero is the only uh, resonance on this line, on this, on this wedge line here. Yeah? With, uh, um, so it's uh, very similar. So it, it, this, this kind of spectrum, yeah, it is known, does not only exist discreetly, it also has a dynamical meaning, and the same dynamical meaning why, uh, as the real resonances in, uh, for flows. Yeah. Uh, this is why we call it real Taylor resonances. And why there is this Taylor, this is uh, something which I, I can only say very, very briefly um, uh, um, now. So, Taylor, because I mean we have a joint uh, spectrum, and uh, in some sense, uh, if you recall uh, the usual strategy to, um, if, to 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 prove discrete spectrum of resonances for flows, yeah, what you have to do is, or very often, or what at least the, in the microlocal community is done, the essential thing is to do a parametrics construction. You have the vector field plus lambda, and you construct a parametrics, which means that you invert it up to a remainder term, which is not small, but uh, quasi-compact. Is that a question? No. Um, the, and then the rest is straightforward. Uh, you have analytic fraton theory, which tells you that the resolving is meromorph, and the poles 
are these uh, discrete uh, real resonances. And now, the, the, in my eyes, the most challenging thing was in this project was to understand what replaces kind of this uh, this machinery. Yeah, because it, uh, if you have several vector fields, uh, what is the resolvent? Yeah, I mean you could talk the resolvent, but in higher dimensions, uh, if you have a complex function, a meromorphic function in complex higher dimension, it has no isolated poles. Yeah, there's a theorem, uh, singular set of a, a meromorphic thing in higher dimension is never discrete, yeah? So this uh, doesn't work this way, and, and, and here is where this Taylor spectrum came into being. And there is a paper in the 70s by Joseph Taylor, which introduces a, a spectral calculus for commuting operators, yeah, bounded commuting operators, and what he does is he constructs a complex. So if you have, um, AI linear operators on a Hilbert space, then he constructs a complex uh, zero H H tensor and I equals one to K. Then you have one forms on RK and it goes obviously until K forms on RK and then there is nothing anymore. And here he constructed some dx minus uh, dA minus lambda, uh, which, is, uh, which has the property that d and d is uh, uh, close, so you get a cohomology here. And his, uh, his definition of spectrum for this operator is lambda is in the Euler spectrum if uh, the cohomology is not <coughs> trivial, which in some sense means that at any of these stages, the co one of these cohomology rules is non-trivial. In the case of, <coughs> important to note, in the case of one operator, yeah, this reduces to the well-known fact that we say something is in the spectrum of one operator if either the kernel is empty, this would be a non-trivial cohomology here, or if the image is not everything, this would be somehow a non-trivial cohomology at the end. Yeah? And if there's just one operator, there's, there's just the beginning and the end. Yeah? And uh, for commuting operators, this um, uh, can be reflected in the Taylor spectrum. And in some sense, that the nice thing is that we observe that this Taylor spectrum, it allows some parametric construction. This is maybe the, the last thing that I I would like to write down. So, the central observation in, for, for both papers is that um, there exists Q lambda, we can construct Q lambda in this complex, which uh, goes, well, first of all, there are anisotropic superlative spaces by. Um, by, by hyperbolicity, yeah? but we can construct some kind of uh, parametrics, which is an operator in this complex and which reduces the order. And it has the property d that dx minus lambda q lambda plus q lambda dx minus lambda is identity plus r of lambda. So everybody who has worked with complexes and cohomology knows that if we would have an operator Q like this, that we have identity here, that this implies that all cohomologies are trivial. This is kind of inversion of the, of the complex. And so we have something which inverts the complex up to a remainder term. And the remainder term, we can prove with microlocal analysis, that this is quasi-compact. And this somehow allows us to reduce this complex to a complex not on Hilbert spaces, but on finite dimensional spaces. And on finite dimensional spaces, roughly speaking, spectrum has to be discrete. Yeah? Uh, very hand -waving. This is somehow a little bit like we have this, uh, this um, we have such a parametrix. Yeah? And uh, in some sense, we, we don't use resolvent, but we somehow need the fact of uh, proving analytic fraton theorem it goes more or less the same way. Yeah? If you have fretonness, yeah? So you, you use things to finite dimensional spaces, and finite dimensional spaces inverses are meromorphic, 
and uh, things become discrete and so on. Yeah? So this is somehow the same philosophy here. And this R lambda has a, has a, has a, this R lambda has an expression, a very explicit expression. It's um, the integral over my open wild chamber e to the minus t x a uh, plus lambda per with a uh, c of a d a, where if you have this cone here, psi is a compactly supported function far in the positive cone. And now, if you are expert in this micro-local techniques, you, you see more or less that it's hand on to prove that this is quasi-compact, because this is more or less, uh, you propagate a long time into a positive direction such that transversally you have stable and instability. This helps you to make these anisotropic spaces work. And, uh, and the fact that the neutral direction here is taken in, into account that we smooth out, that we have a smooth function here which regularizes into the, you know, I mean, we smooth out into the direction of the flow which gives regularization in the, the stable direction. And then it's more or less following, not even for Huistand, but even the first paper for Royce Huistand on the diffeomorphism, which uh, these ideas directly give you that these operators are quasi compact. And uh, last thing, so um, the, uh, you can prove that if you take R, R0 to the power of k, then this gives a rank 1 projector, and this is um, 1 mu. So you have the, the constant 1 function is an eigenfunction of R0, of obviously, with eigenvalue 1, and mu is the dual, uh, the dual eigenfunction. Um, and this gives you the SRV measure. And if you have this characterization of an SRV measure in terms of a spectral projector of some dynamically defined uh, object. It's not R0, no? Sorry? It's not R0. Yes? R0? It's a one eigenvalue of R0. Lambda 0 is uh, a thing, no? The spectral projector is not R0 to the. Spectral key. projector, yeah. Ah, no, uh, yeah, limit, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, limit R to infinity of this guy exists because R0 has an eigenvalue, so if you take the limit, if you compose the limit, you get the spectral projector at one, this is a rank one operator, yeah, this was wrong, the limit was missing, yeah, um, and uh, you have this measure popping up, and then you can use, for example, the techniques of Dyatlov and Swarovski in this setting, uh, which gives you trace formula and so on, and you can express this measure mu in terms of period. Do we have some more questions for uh, Tobias? Uh, so, in this uh, Taylor spectrum, yeah. does uh, if I take uh, dx1, dx2, dxk on the torus? Yeah. Do, do I find what I think I would find? So the lattice on the. Yeah. So this yeah. is the. Okay. And you always know that the first cohomology group is non trivial? Sorry? The first, I mean, the ah. H0 is it always non trivial? Yeah. Or? This is also part of our theorem that um, we can prove that, in some sense, thanks to this uh, fact that we can reduce this to a finite dimensional complex, then this kind of is more or less a theory of matrices yeah. acting on invariant subspaces. And for the matrices, you can prove that, um, well, it's S in, it's S in uh, for one matrix, yeah? A matrix is injective if and only if it's surjective, if and only if it's bijective. Mm -hmm. And this, um, as we reduce to finite dimensional thing, we get this, that if the complex is non-trivial somewhere, it has to be non-trivial at the first thing. And this is, uh, yeah, you recognize this. This is, uh, it gives you joint eigenfunctions, yeah? Mm -hmm. Is there some corresponding argument for maximal entropy measure, or because uh, no, we've not done this. But uh, there is hope that for maximal entropy measure, I think uh, I mean we've done it. Uh, we've, we've done the spectral theory on arbitrary bundles. So, for example, we can do the spectral theory on forms. And then I think uh, it's not clear if you change the weight that it still works. No, the weight not. But you think you can. Can't you recover the, spec the, the measure of uh, maximal entropy also as in forms, working on uh, 
the, the forms of rank, uh, the dimension of the unstable bundle. Yeah. Then usually you should get out this measure of maximal entropy. Yeah. But it's not. I mean, it's just an. I hope that it should work. Yeah. The measure uh, is constructed. The measure is constructed by Carrasco and Rodriguez Hertz with yes. the same method. They construct two me two measures, one with the Jacobian and one with. Uh, potential one. So Jacobian is a savvy measure and potential one is theoretically the maximum entropy. So it's not, it's not known that this exists in general, but it's not known with the spectral theoretic measures. Yeah, we done, but in principle, we think yeah. should be doable. Yeah, I mean, it's truly an effort, but... Uh, Maybe working with Grassmannian extension or something, we can do uh, like uh, powers of the Jacobian, the uh, powers of the unstable Jacobian. Okay. Yeah. We have enough. Thank you.